Hey church, just wanted to take this time and uh, let you guys know a few things that really are so great to watch through sponsorship. We've been watching the lives of the kids over the years and seeing the transformation that comes with a child being sponsored. We've seen kids that did not have a family that loved them, that would come to the care point and find love and find hope and find the hope of Jesus. And these kids actually that are now in university, some of them are even working, that would come back to me and say, Pastor, if it were not for the care point, we would not be here. We do not have a family. We do not have people that believed in us. But the care point was a very safe place for us to play and be ourselves. And if we had needs, the care point would make sure our needs are taken care of. So one of our kids just graduated high school and, and, and got accepted in our local and university. She's going to be doing teaching and she was very young when we found her. Hello church, my name is Telio Machaba. I'm 22 years old. I'm one of the kids who live at Abba's house. But my actual home is in Sawin, where I was raised by my mom. I never met my father. I thank God bring Pastor Medici and Miss Purity into my life. When my mother passed away, I didn't have anyone to take care of me, to pay for my school fees. So Pastor came, he took good care of me. I'm glad that I uh, now come to my high school and I'm looking forward to go to the university this coming September. I pray and hope to get scholarships so that I can continue with my studies. I would like to thank the church family for everything, the care, the love they showed me since I came here. I pray that God may provide them with their needs. May God bless you. I love you so much. Sponsorship is just more than just you know, sending funds to a child, but it's building a future. It's building uh, the country. It's building our communities. It's shown us that it's, it's more than just, you know, a hot meal every day. We are able as well with uh, sponsoring a child, we're able to help the children medically. We can take care of them and make sure that they are healthy. We can take them to the hospital whenever they need help. Uh, it's just been amazing to see all of those things coming together. And if you're sponsoring a child at Abba's house, that now is it's just a full package because the child gets a home to live in. They get a bed, they get clothes, they get, I mean, they're, they're, they're taken care of in, in every way, 24 seven, they are covered. They know these people praying for them, supporting them. So it's just been amazing to see kids come here with nothing at all and have clothes and have a family and have parents that, that are going to love them. So I just wanted to take this time and say thank you so much, Church, for everything that you are doing, you have done over the years. Really, you have been an answered prayer to the kids. You've been a place for the kids that they know they have a safe place because there's you on, on the side helping out. So I just want to take this time and say what you're doing really is changing the world. Man, whew. changing the world, amen? amen? Just one person at a time. That was an orphan, and that's the, we have an orphanage in Haley, Haley, Africa, and uh, it's called Abba's House, and we have 19 orphans that are in Abba's House. This is our oldest orphan, and it's funny, uh, Cindy, when they, uh, I think we were up there last year and they said, hey, you know, we've been continuing to take care of, but they call aging out. Uh, the orphan, you know, she aged out. And so what do you want to do? I said, what are we going to do? I said, we're her family. I said, you tell her she can stay there the rest of her life if she needs to. Can I get an amen? You know, the Bible talks about true religion. We measure and judge churches by so many things, and it's nothing that God even thinks about. When God talks about the church, he said, what really matters to me is, are you taking care of the orphan? Are you taking care of the widow? Are you bringing in the homeless? Are you visiting me at prison? Are you going to the hospital? He said, these are the things that matter to me. That's what means so much to me. 
And church, you need to understand something by belonging to this campus and this church, Church International, we do that every single day. Every single day. I know like uh, our care point, we have a care point in Hala Haley. We're feeding 350 kids a day, Monday through Friday. Uh, in Mexico, we have another care point. We have 100 kids over there. By the way, Saul and uh, Michelle are here with us today from our Mexico campus. Come on, stand up, guys. Stand up. So good to have you guys. Appreciate y'all so much. They're down for camp. We had a uh, uh, youth camp, and I'll I tell you what, ooh, y'all going to hear about that next week. Pastor Sam, youth camp was incredible, just life-changing and touching, but they're down for that. So, But we're in Mexico with a care point. We're in uh, Haley Haley with a care point. So that's if you counted that up, it's about 450 kids Monday through Friday, and then with the orphanage. Uh, here's the deal. You know, if I want to say, man, I want to do that. I want to help, you know, do an orphanage. I want to help, you know, feed a bunch of kids. Well, by myself, you know what? I can do hardly nothing. Yeah. But when we all put our resources together yeah. under one purpose, yeah. one heart, yeah. look what can get done. Yeah. I tell people, I said, man, for the size of our church and what we do, we do a lot in the world. And but it's because we join together, we unite together and we have one purpose, and that is to serve uh, those that are struggling, those that are hurting, the orphan, the widow, all these different areas. But we have an opportunity for you to help with that if you're not already doing that, because a lot of us, we already sponsor children and Cindy, I want to sponsor another one. And so I want you to go on and sponsor another one uh, uh, because you know, I'm, you're talking about when you sponsor a kid in one of our care points, you're talking about 20 bucks a month, 20 bucks a month. I went and got coffee the other day and coffee's now up to 650. And you know, you go to one of them coffee shops, of course you gotta get the fancy stuff, right? And so six feet, I'm like three times going to the coffee shop. I could sponsor a kid in Africa. Come on, someone. The, it's so little of a sacrifice. We've been sponsoring kids for, and, and a lot of you have for a long time, Cindy. And I've never missed the money that we use to sponsor kids. Matter of fact, it's a great privilege for us. As a matter of fact, our lives are blessed because of it. And the $20, completely all of it goes to service those children, to feed them, to give them the gospel, to help them medically. And uh, we have an opportunity to not just be some of us that are doing this, but to be all of us that are doing this. I believe every Christian should have a kid sponsored. I really do. I believe that's something that all of us can do. It's not something hard, but it's something very impactful. And as we do it together, it makes a huge impact in the world. And on the Abba's house, when you, you'll see when you pull up, we have a website. And Tina, is Tina in this service right here? Where you at, Tina? Tina, thank you for putting all this together. You worked so hard on all this. Come here, y'all give Tina a hand clap. Thank you. Tina, they can just go to the website, right, by going to this QR code. You can also get to it from our website, but you go there and go back, go back to the uh, picture you had. I know they got to take a picture of this, but uh, you'll see there's a list of kids. You can go to the different sites. You can go to Hala Haley uh, Care Point. You can go to Mexico Care Point. You can go to Abba's house. You'll notice that the orphans, we, they're, they're $40 a month. And we actually use three people to sponsor one orphan because we have to feed them three meals a day. We have to have a house. We have to have electricity. We got to pay staff to take care of them. And so it's a lot more expensive to be able to do that. So it's $40 uh, a child to do that. And so you can either do an orphan or a care point or both, whatever you want to do. Go back to the QR code and you just got to pull up this QR code and uh, on your phone. Uh, if you don't know how to you know, deal with that, we have a table in the foyer. And you can pick your child. You can actually go down. You'll see all the children. You'll be able to pick your own child uh, to be able to sponsor them. And I really, church, I'm just encouraging you, uh, consider this. Because this is, you want to make a difference? This is how you make a difference. Amen? And when we do it together, we can help so many more. Amen? Well, praise God. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. And so, man, who's ready for the word of the Lord? Yes. You know, in this series, uh, Reach, and we're talking about, you know, reaching out to others. I've been pastoring now for over 30 years, and for over 30 years, people have come to me and they'll say, you know, pastor, what can I do? You know, what, what do you want me to do? How can I make a difference? 
And maybe, I don't know, maybe it's me, maybe uh, David, I, I just don't know how to communicate or something. Uh, I, I don't know. I, it's hard because it's, when I tell people what I'm about to tell you, it kind of just goes over everybody's head and people just, you know, some, some take up the mantle, but many do not. And so when they asked me, I said, well, I said, to be honest with you, what I need, what I need is for you to find three or four people, five people, eight people, however many, and I need you to really embrace them, reach out to them, uh, open up your life to them and, and help them grow in the Lord. I want you to connect with them like for real, have them over to your house, you over to their house, uh, help them to get involved. Uh, minister to them, hear what's going on in their life, just, just help them. I said, that's, that's the ministry. That's the work. And people just look at me. I guess they think, you know, do you want me to come paint a stripe in the parking lot? Do you want me to come park cars? Do you want me to play an instrument? And look, we need all that stuff done. But the real work is embracing people and helping them walk this out. Can I get an amen? That's the real work that we have to do. And then I read in the scripture in Luke uh, 10 2, I, I read about Jesus when he looked out and he saw all the people and he looked at all their needs and everything and realizing that uh, he's at this moment confined, confined to his body and this, this physical body that he had. That's why he told the disciples, it's your advantage that I go away because then the Holy Spirit comes and he's omnipresent. But he realized the limitations of, of just, you know, one person that you need other people to get involved in this thing. And, and he said, he said, look, the harvest is plentiful. He looked out and he said, the harvest is plentiful. He was looking at the people. Let me tell you something. In this world that we live in, there is no problem with the harvest. There is, there is, it's almost like in Christianity, we're waiting on the harvest to come. And the Lord is like, no, the harvest is already there. Quit waiting on something that's there and go out in the field and pick it. You can't just wait for it to come. You have to realize it's there and then go pick it. And he, so he says the harvest is plentiful, but watch this. The laborers are few. I can't find people who will be willing to do what I'm doing with these 12 disciples, to walk with them, to live with them, to encourage them, to grow them, and to get them to a place where they can do it with someone else. You see, that is the work. That's what we're called to do. And he says... Therefore, plead with the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into the harvest. So he's like, he was having the same problem. And he said, so I'm telling y'all, we got to plead to the father. Yeah. Now, why would you plead to the father? Because only the father can move your hearts. Yeah, come on. I can't. Why would you do anything? Because I told you to do it anyway. I mean, who am I really? But the father. He's the heavenly father. So, Father, I pray to you that today you're going to stir the hearts of your people. And in stirring the hearts of your people, looking at the harvest that is all around us, oh God, that, Father, you're going to stir our hearts to embrace it, to, to go do the work that needs to be done, God. Lord, I pray for that. I believe for that. I'm pleading you, Lord. Let there be people that rise up from this very room, from this very building, from the prison that... I'm speaking to you guys in the jail or to those online or on television. Let our hearts be stirred, Lord, to invest in others, to reach out to others. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, amen, amen. and amen. So, yes, we're talking about reach again this week. Now, when it comes to reaching people, we must first be willing to go do it. It's one thing to know what we are to do. But then we have to actually put feet to it. We actually have to go and do it. That's why Jesus said in Matthew 28, when he was given the Great Commission, that's why he said, this is what I want you to do. I want you to go. I want you to go and I want you to make disciples of all nations. And we're, we are, we're all over different nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe everything in which I've taught you. And then when you're doing that, lo, I'm going to be with you always. And so, but the whole point, he said, I need you to go do this. And so we need to realize that there are people out there that we need to go reach, that we have to go from our home and go to where they're at. But you know what? It's on your everyday journey. Like we talked about last week, 
It's at your workplace. It's, it's neighbors around you. It's immediate family. We, we need to be those that are going out and, and, and reaching them. Reaching them with what? With the gospel. With the gospel. You know, Romans 1.16 says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes. And so who wants to walk in the power of God? Raise your hand. All right, so the rest of y'all don't want to walk in the power of God? I said, who wants to walk in the power of God? Raise your hand. Okay, this is an interactive service, right? All right, so to walk in the power of God is to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. Is to talk about how, hey, God created all the heavens and the earth. And Jesus Christ is the only son of God. He was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under the hands of Pontius Pilate. And he, he, he was crucified, died, and was buried. And he rose again on the third day. He ascended to the Father, where he's seated at the right hand of the Father, and he's coming back to judge the living and the dead. The Father had to punish Jesus so he wouldn't have to punish us. I believe in the Holy Spirit. I believe in the universal church. I believe in the forgiveness of sin. I believe in everlasting life. Is anyone in here believe the gospel of Jesus Christ? That's what we believe, and that's what we need to send to people. Sometimes I think we're seeing people struggle, and we see a harvest out there, and we're trying to use all this other stuff to try to fix them. But when you try to do that, what happens is it's going to all crumble because the foundation has not been built. And the foundation that has to be built first and foremost, and it's the only one that we can build on, the Bible says, is the foundation of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Come on, is anyone here with me on that? And when you share Christ with someone, the power of God comes in operation in your life, comes through you, and impacts them in a mighty way. We are called, guys, not to just be here and be citizens here. We are called to be ambassadors. We represent more than just America. We represent the kingdom of God. And we are called and we are said that we're ambassadors to this world. What is an ambassador? Is someone who represents the kingdom they come from. They don't represent themselves. They represent the kingdom they come from. We're not here in the world to represent ourselves. We're here in the world to represent Jesus, to represent our Holy Father, the kingdom in which we are a part of. And that's why it says, therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ. As through God, as though God were making an appeal through us, we beg you on behalf of Christ to be reconciled to God. I want you to see this. God, we're making an appeal through us. God looks at the world and he says, I want to reach the world, but the only way I can is if you, as ambassadors for me, go and talk to them. And I will move through you to them so that they can be reconciled to the Father. That's the Holy Spirit being with you. That's Jesus Christ being with you, helping you with this. We, sh we should have our life with this purpose and ambition. This, this should be our life purpose and ambition, is to wake up every day and to, and to look at it as not going out to make money to pay bills or just have fun, but to go out and while I'm making money to pay bills, while I'm having fun, I realize that there's something greater that I'm a part of and it's the kingdom of God. And so while I'm out on my journey, my eyes are going to be open, my ears are going to be ready to hear what the Spirit is saying. And I'm going to move and I'm going to look for people that I can reach with the gospel of Jesus Christ to reconcile people to God. Because let me tell you something, this will fill your life with an abundant life. It's the main meal that truly will satisfy you. There, I, I watch it all the time. Christians get stagnant. They get stagnant and then they start blaming the church they went to or the pastor and they don't realize the reason why you're stagnant has nothing to do with any of that. The reason why you're stagnant is because you're doing nothing. You're just existing. You're just receiving. And if all you're doing is just receiving and doing nothing, then you're, you're going to get stagnant. That's a pond that's just sitting there that has no outflow. It only has an inflow. And eventually that pond gets stagnant. We're not called to be ponds. We're called to be rivers. We're called to be rivers with an outlet that we pour into other rivers. That's what river, a river does. It pours into other rivers and it pours into the ocean. 
We're, we are called to pour into other Christians, and we're called to pour our lives into the ocean of unbelievers. Can I get an amen? amen. Giving them life. That's what we're called to do. And that's when you're going to be the most fulfilled in your life. People get stagnant and they say, man, I, I'm just not getting fed and, uh, you know, I don't know. Let me, let me tell you something. If you're doing nothing for God, why should he keep feeding you? If you want to get fed, start giving it out and God will give you more. Or he'll take what he gave you and give it to someone else who will do it. Come on, this is scripture. This is, what, this is what God says. And so we're called to go. We're called to give the gospel. We're called to give our lives to other people. That is the real reason you exist and are still here. Is to give God glory and then to share him with others. If you're wondering why you're here, that's why you're here. Amen. Now, how can we reach people and reconcile them to God? How can we do that? I'm going to give you three simple ways to do this, okay? Very simple ways. As a matter of fact, uh, you know, we should be writing and taking notes. I do every time I sit down and hear someone preach, but these are so simple that, you know, even, you know, even someone gray-haired like me will remember them. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> The first way is you have to listen to people's story. So the gospel is, is open when you first listen. Let's look at this. Jesus went to Zacchaeus' house to hear his story and to give him hope. He saw Zacchaeus. He said, hey, I'm coming to your house. Went to his house. He heard his story. He listened and he, he gave him hope while he was doing it. Or, or Jesus walked with the two men on the road to Emmaus and Ask them, you know, what's going on in your lives, guys? And he sat there and he listened to what they had experienced and what was going on in their life. And then he just conversed with them. Later on, after they realized it was Christ, they said, man, didn't your heart just burn on the inside? But he first listened. He first said, hey, tell me what's going on. Tell me about your life. Jesus sat and listened to people's stories of things they were struggling with. And then Jesus then would reach out and heal them. Tell me what you need. Tell me what's going on. And then he would reach out and he would heal them. You know, uh, this week, Monday through Wednesday, I went to Arizona. Let me tell you about Arizona. Arizona be hot. I, I thought we hot. Arizona hotter. We got more humidity, but they got this weird dry heat. It was 117 degrees. My feet were melting. My shoes were melting. I was on the, I was on the black top, and I was like, I think, my, <laughs> I think my titty shoes are melting. I mean, you talk about hot, Jesus. And, and then you would think, okay, it's hot, but maybe you get a breeze. It was 8 o'clock one night, and we're coming out of one of the prisons, and uh, I was actually about 8.30, and I said, man, how, it's so hot. How hot is it? And they said, uh, well, it's still 104 degrees at, at 8.30 at night. And I said, well, maybe this breeze will help. And we got out of the building, and man, this breeze hit me, and I was like, it felt like, I got a dog named Bishop, it felt like he was just breathing in my face. <laughs> it was hot air. <laughs> it's like someone took a blow dryer and just, just blow it in my face. It didn't help at all. It actually made it even hotter. And you know what the crazy thing is? Me and Pastor Matt, uh, we were drinking, you know, because you say you got to drink, because you don't sweat. I mean, normally how you would go outside and we soak in wet, got to change shirts. You don't sweat there. I just wore the same thing for three days. Can I get an amen? <laughs> Didn't sweat. Cindy knows me. Yeah, don't bother me a bit. <laughs> People in that plane on the way back, it might have bothered them a little bit maybe. <laughs> but you didn't sweat. And so, man, we're drinking, drinking, drinking electrolytes and water and just, you know, all this stuff. And I was like, we're not sweating. And we never went to the bathroom. I'm like, where's this stuff going? <laughs> it was crazy how hot it was. But we connected with Prison Fellowship. Prison Fellowship is a national ministry that's in prisons all over the world. They just do amazing work. And uh, it's a divine connection how we ended up connecting with them. They're connecting with us in LifeHouse. And we're just talking about how we can, uh, you know, connect with helping prisoners when they're getting out and this, you know, that kind of stuff. But uh, they want us to go to these prisons to minister. 
And so, man, we'd wake up 5.30, meet at 5.30, 6 o'clock, we're at the prison. And uh, we'd minister to about almost noon in the one prison. And then we'd leave, drive, you know, three hours, get to another prison, do the same thing, leave about nine at night. And so it was, it was no grass uh, grew underneath our feet. Not that any grass grows out there, but it was, it was <laughs> everything desolate unless you're watering it. Um, but one of the things that we did, I wasn't sure how this was going to go. And you just got to be ready. And uh, they just like open up the door. They said, there's the courtyard. And there's hundreds of criminals and murderers and thieves and rapists and everything you can imagine. And they said, just go minister. And I'm like, okay. And so <laughs> you know my cold call city. And so Pastor Matt, you know, he, he shoots basketball really good. He's, he's a, a world record holder in free throws and three points, actually, and free throws. And uh, so he grabs a basketball, and we brought about seven basketballs. He just starts shooting on the court. And so he got some people to come in like that. Uh, we brought a Christian rapper, and so we put some music up. You know, I got up there, and I was like, yeah, man, yeah, man, what we got? Yeah, we all here. We here to minister to you. You know what I'm saying? And so, no, I didn't do none of that. <laughs> I know my plays, right? And so I'm no rapper at all. And uh, so it was quite a few. We had people from California helping us, uh, Arizona, and of course, Pastor Matt and I are from Alabama, Louisiana. But I would just look across the yard, and I'd just see people, and I was listening in my, my spiritual ears, and I'd just look across, and I would just sense and lock on someone. And I'd just stop, and normally it was the meanest looking one. And I'll just, uh, okay, Lord, <laughs> go before me. And, uh, and he will. And I would just go up to him and, you know, look at him and say, hey, my name's Pastor Mark. What's your name, buddy? And they would tell me. And I would say, well, I said, man, why don't you just tell me your story? I just want to hear your story. And every time, you know, when it, I said, my name's Pastor Mark, he go, and he, yeah, my name's, you know, Joe or whatever. And, and just kind of shake my hand and look at me. And I said, man, why don't you just tell me your story? And you know what they'll do? Their shoulders would go down. And I just seen they relax and they would just start talking. And I did that over and over and over and over and over again in those prisons that we went to. And you know, not one time, not one guy rejected me. Amen. Not one time. Because normally someone's going up to him and say, oh, let me tell you this. Let me tell you how you live your life. Let me tell you, you know, what's going on. And, and that's what they're used to. But I just went up and I said, hey, man, just tell me your story. <laughs> One of them was like, you really want to know my story? I'm like, I do. I want to know your story. You know, I killed some people. I'm like, all right, I, that's, I'm fine with that. Just don't kill me. You know, what's your story? And he said, you sure you want me to open this can of worms? I said, look, I'm a bird. I eat worms. I can do it. Give it to me. I'm an early bird. I get up. I eat the worms all the time. Give it to me. And but he just unloaded and just unloaded and unloaded and just his story. And it was so healing, really, for them to do that. But it was just, you know, and you know what happened after, you know, that that happens when they tell you a story, then it opens the door. Because I was just there to listen. And guys, it's an amazing way. One, one of the guys I was talking to, I'm just sitting there listening. Actually, we sit on the bench, and I'm just sitting there listening to him. And normally I'd have like two or three or maybe sometimes one, sometimes two, sometimes five. And, uh, but this guy just, you know, pouring out his heart, and I'm just sitting and just listening intently. And he just stopped, and he said, you're so easy to talk to. You know what makes someone easy to talk to? I figured this out. Just don't say nothing. <laughs> Just don't say nothing. As a matter of fact, Job said that about his friends. He said, when y'all kept your mouth shut, y'all are great friends. <laughs> but when y'all tried to figure all this out, y'all became messed up. And so it's just listen. Just listen. You'll be amazed at what it opens up. I had a homeless guy the other day, and I took him to lunch. Got him outside the road, took him to lunch, and he's, I can tell, you know, he just kind of, normally probably everyone's telling him this, tell him that, tell him that, and he said, uh, what, you, what you want? I said, nothing. I said, I just want to hear your story. 
And again, you see the shoulders go down and they just begin to talk. And, and, and just listening to their story. You know why? Because I care about their story. Everyone's story is important. You know, are we going to people's houses like Jesus went to Zacchaeus' house? Are we walking with people on a journey like Jesus walked with those men on that journey to uh, Jericho? Are we listening to what ails them and then moving to help them? But if you want to reach the people around you and God wants you to reach them, he wants you to go, he wants you to reach them. It all starts, but hey, you see someone struggling. Hey, you want to have coffee, man? Or you go up to them. Man, what's going on? Tell me your story. You'll start reaching people like crazy because you want to hear their story. Now, after they tell you their story, guess what they're open to? Your story. And that's the second part of this. So you listen to people's story, and then you tell your story. You know, in John 4, 28 and 30, the woman left her water pots. This is what Jesus had the encounter at the well and uh, shared everything about our life. And she left her water pots after the experience and went to the city and said to the people, come see a man who told me all things that I have done. It says, this is not the Christ, is he? They left the city and were coming to him. So here's a woman that after encountering Jesus, she realized, I've got to tell someone. I got to tell someone. And she went to the city and she said, I just can't keep this to myself. I got to tell someone. And this one woman who didn't have a great reputation, by the way, she was married to five different men. And then this was her, uh, the one she was with, she wouldn't even marry to. So back then, that was, I mean, that was very much down looked at. Uh, and it's still something not good to God. Can I get an amen? But even with that, when she started telling her story, People took notice because they saw something in her. When Jesus touches you, there is something different about you. And people can recognize that. And I want you to notice, they said, you got to come see this man. Church, hear me when I say this. We got to quit inviting people to church and start inviting people to Jesus. Here's the thing. I never once brought up church to not one of those prisoners. But I brought up Jesus because I know this, that if you bring people to Jesus, Jesus will bring people to church. Amen. Come on, someone. And I think sometimes it's almost a cop out for us Christians because you're like, oh, go let the pastor talk to him. No, God wants to use you to talk to them. I make an appeal through you, my ambassador. And I want you to share with them. I want you to plead with them to be reconciled to the Father through Jesus Christ. I want you to do that. This is what God wants. This is what he desires. That woman brought the whole city to Jesus. Can we not bring this whole community to Jesus? Do I have any women in here that can bring this whole community to Jesus? What about the man that got the demons cast out? He's in the graveyard, he had full of demons, and Jesus cast the demons out. And after he cast the demons out, and they went to the pigs, and the pigs jumped in the lake. You know, it, the, it said, but the man uh, from whom the demons had gone out was begging him that he might accompany him. But Jesus uh, sent him away, saying this to him. It says, return to your home and describe what great things God has done for you. So he went away, proclaimed throughout the city what great things Jesus had done for him. See, I think sometimes we think that, you know, I, I've got to go somewhere. I've got to go to Africa. I've got to go to Mexico. I've got to, you know, go to this. Uh, someone's got to invite me to a church and I've got to go to this church so I can preach. And we think that that's how we get the gospel. And, and sometimes he does call different ones of us to do that. You know, he called me to go to Arizona. But for most people, you know what he does? He says, no, what I need you to do is I need to go back where you live because people know how you once were. And when they see that you're not like that anymore, I want you to open up your mouth and I want you to tell your story that you got touched by the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And that same one that touched you can touch them if they go to you. Come to Jesus. Come on, someone. 
Everybody's looking, man, I need a ministry. I mean, we have a ministry. It's the ministry of reconciliation. And we have a, a harvest already around you. It's those that live with you. It's those that are akin to you. It's those that are neighbors with you. It's those that work with you. I hear Christians all the time tell me, man, I hate going to my job. There's number number heathens at my job. Number lost people at my job. I'm like, my God, why do you think God sent you there? Quit thinking about yourself and start thinking about why God sent you there. He sent you there to be a light in the darkness, to hear their story, and then to tell what I've done in your life so that they might be reached and reconciled to the Father. Come on, someone. That's why you are there. Are we going out and telling people what the Father and the Lord Jesus has done for us? Sometimes I think our story, well, my story ain't that much. You know, it, it ain't like that guy that, you know, man, I was on drugs for this long and, and man, I killed all these people and God touched me and now I'm, I don't have a story like that. Let me tell you something. Your story is your story. And God gave you your story and he put people in front of you because they need to hear your story. So quit worrying about comparing with others. And worry about your story. There's one thing that you can't argue with is what God's done in my life. You can argue with me about doctrine. You can argue with me about how this should be done and that should be done. But one thing you can't argue with me about is what God's done in me because I know what God's done in me. Can I get an amen? And that's how we share. Not one time did I have an argument with any of those guys. Out of all the different ones we talked to. Because, guess what? I know my story. You can't argue with what God's done in me. Amen? Amen. So once you've listened to their story, you told your story, the third thing we have to do to to fulfill making disciples, teaching them to observe everything in which I've taught you. By the way, discipleship is not giving people knowledge. That's the first part of it. Discipleship is teaching them to observe the knowledge. It's teaching them, how do I take what the Bible says and make it work in my marriage? How do I take what the Bible says and make it work in my finances? How do I take what the Bible says and make it work in my relationships? How do I take what the Bible says and make it work in my own mental health? How do I take what the Bible says and, and, and make it work uh, in my purpose in life and what I'm supposed to be doing here? And, and that's what we're called to do is to lead them to Christ and then to teach them how Christ says we should live our life so that we can have life and life more abundant, all the way to the point where they're not just receiving, but they then reciprocate it, and they go out, and they do the same thing for someone else that you just did for them. But to do that, we have to make room in our life for others. Look, I know we live in a world that everything's just busy, busy, but you got to make, we've got to make room for others, amen? We have to. We've got to open up our lives, open up our calendars, if we're going to reach anyone, you'll never reach it. My, my father-in-law told me one time, he told me, he said, hey, uh, Mark, he said, we're picking corn Saturday. It was like on a Thursday. We're picking corn Saturday. And I'm like, well, I looked at my calendar. I said, I can't do it this Saturday. I can do it about three Saturdays from now. And he said, son, put his hand on my shoulder. He said, you don't plan The harvest around the calendar, you plan the calendar around the harvest. We want people to plan their lives around ours. And God says, that's not how you reach them. You get the harvest by planning your life around them. By making room in your life for others. That's why Philippians 2, 1 through 5 says, therefore... If there is any encouragement in Christ, if any consolation of love, if any fellowship of the spirit, if any affection or compassion, make my joy complete by being of the same mind, maintaining the same love, united in the spirit, intent on this one purpose. What purpose? To see people change, to see lives change, to see the gospel preached, to see people get saved. Do nothing from selfish or empty conceit, but with humility, consider one another as more important than yourselves. Do not merely look out for your own personal interests, but also for the interests of others. You see, when you're others minded, you make room for others. Have this attitude yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus. We got to make room. 
We got to make room. Are we called? We are called to open our homes to others. We are called to go to the homes of others. We are called to help others. We are called to serve others. We are called to love others. Are we making room in our lives for others? And you know, when I thought about this, Pastor Joey and Sarai, I, I, really what this describes is a connect group leader. That's, that's what this describes. What does our connect group leaders do? They open up their homes. They go to other people's homes. They have coffee with people. They reach out with people. And, and they try to reach people to bring them in, to teach them about Jesus, and to go further in their life. And I said, that's really all this is. That is the real work of the ministry. It's spending time with others and helping others to grow in the Lord. All the way to a point where then they reciprocate it, they can go and do it as well. And that's, you know, this is a great time. August coming up. I believe there are Christians. You've been a Christian. If you've been a Christian over three years, four years, there's no reason you shouldn't be running your own connect group. You know two people, three people, four. Now, look, if you go to people and you say, hey, I want you to come to this uh, church group, then you're going to get pushback. But if you go and you spend time and build a relationship and say, hey, why don't you come to the house and I built a relationship, you know, I got three, four guys, I built a relationship, we're just going to talk about Jesus. We're just going to the scripture and talk about Jesus. You know what? They'll come. They'll come. So you got to make it about him. But I believe there are people right in this room that God is going to stir to, man, I can do this. Do it with your own family. Do it with your own family. Do it with the friends you have. They don't, it's better if they've never been to church. It's better if they're lost. Can I get an amen? Because that's who we're trying to save. And watch what God will do. Go tell people your story. Listen to people's story. And make room in your life for others. That's what is needed in the kingdom of God. And when we're all doing that, guess what? Just like, just like the orphanage can be an orphanage because not one, but a bunch of us is giving to it. The kingdom can expand and grow the same way. It's when all of us are doing what we're supposed to do. Amen? And we join together reaching others. You are an ambassador. This idea that that's for the pastor, that's for the staff, that's hogwash. It's not what the scripture says. Scripture actually says they're there to train you and to teach you and to prod you. I know I'm prying, you know. I don't mean to be prying. Well, I guess I do mean to be prying. Part of the reason to come to church is so that you can get prodded. I mean, that's, that's part of the purpose of coming together and having a preacher preach. Is preacher, preacher. So you can be prodded. So that you can be encouraged to, come on, you can do this. You, you, if you're stagnant, you don't have to be stagnant. You can start reaching people, helping people, and your stagnicity, I don't even know if that's a word, but it sounded good. To go, look that up. That's got to be a word. That just sounded so good. Your stagnicity will be gone. Can I get an amen? And you'll get electrified and on fire for God. And you know what? God will start pouring into you. Because you're doing something with what he's giving you. Go and reach the world. That's what Jesus would say to you. Go, 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 go. I remember that song. It's an old song. I got to tell somebody. I got to tell someone. I got to tell someone what Jesus done for me. You know, if we find ourselves only telling people about hobbies and our likes and what does that say? Our mouth should also speak about Jesus. That should be on our lips. Matter of fact, it says what comes out of our lips is what's really going on in our hearts. Amen. Come on, let's stand to our feet. Sorry, I didn't mean to challenge you, but I did. Uh, I believe 
Some of you, I, I, I sense this right here. I believe there's some, some in the room, you stagnant. And God says, all you got to do is those three simple things and you will come alive. You will come alive. Some of you, I'm sensing this in the spirit too. I didn't do this in other services. I like you better. That's why, you know, some of you, some of you, uh, you're, you're struggling. And because you're focusing on your struggle, you're struggling more. Quit focusing on your struggle and start helping someone else struggle. That's struggling and your struggle will go away. I'm serious. If you start helping someone else with their struggle, your struggle goes away. That's how it works. That's how healing comes. And so I want to encourage if that's you. Holy Father, I pray that you stir the hearts of all of us in here. Stir our hearts, oh God. Open our eyes, open our ears. Let us reach the harvest. I pray to you, Father. Send forth your laborers. Into the, there's so many people hurting on the jobs in our community all around us. God, let us have eyes to see, ears to hear. Let us, my God, make room in our life. Let us listen. Let us, let us share our stories. Let there be revival. Lord, I pray this. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, amen and amen. Let's give the Lord a hand clap, amen. Please don't forget about sponsoring a child. I love you guys. Let's go change the world together. God bless you. Thank you. Hey, thank you so much for watching. Please like this video. Comment if there's anything on your heart that you would like to share with the community. And be sure to subscribe and turn on your notifications so that you can be alerted every time we upload something new. You be blessed.